Deep listening. الاستماع العميق. Deep listening. Intensive to hear. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. Impact beyond words. With your ears, you're not just listening, you're also seeing, you're also feeling, you're also all of those aspects. So the same with your eyes. You need to hear with your eyes sometimes. And I know that sounds really strange, but for example, with my eyes, I can hear what they're hearing. In this episode of Deep Listening, Impact Beyond Words, we talk to Tracy, a broadcast journalist. This is an unusual interview. It takes a little bit longer to unwrap the gift box of listening, but it's a gift absolutely worth waiting for. In this interview, we have four distinct parts where we can learn about listening to yourself and how a journalist prepares for an interview, the thought the planning, the reading, the watching, the listening that goes into planning for the interview. The importance of asking others about who you're interviewing and how those perspectives will help you listen more deeply and bring some powerful insights and new perspectives for the listener. We deeply explore the life in the day of a broadcast journalist and understand the techniques required to stay focused in a fast-paced newsroom. The second part of this interview is about what Asia can teach us all about listening, about what's said, and more importantly, about what's unsaid, about listening with open eyes, with open ears, and an open heart. We explore the importance of language, its syntax and its context, and how to listen to history and art in a country to help you connect better with their people and their culture so that you can listen deeply. In the third part, we explore the role of learning from other cultures, ancient cultures, the culture of the First Nations of Australia, the Aboriginal nations, and what they can teach us about listening, the importance of slowing down, of listening completely and thoroughly and being comfortable with silence and the depth and the power that that brings to both the speaker and the listener. Listen out for the story of Clinton Pryor and his 6,000 kilometre trek from one side of Australia to another as he listened to regional and remote Aboriginal communities to bring a powerful message to political leaders in the nation's capital. In the last part of this interview, we're listening for meaning and how being genuinely curious, Tracy's interviews with a homeless man helps us not only listen to what he has to say, but make sure that his story is fully heard. Let's unwrap the gift box of listening together with Tracy. So, Tracy, you're a professional journalist and you're often in a studio. So, talk our listeners through how to set up correctly for an interview. Well, it's interesting, isn't it? Because I work mostly on radio. TV is very different, uh, but I love radio because it's very intimate and generally it's one person talking or one person interviewing somebody else and one person listening. You don't do it in big groups. The radio is when you're in the car or people that can't sleep at night have the radio on tuned to a station that delivers something they want to hear, whether that's music, classical, pop, rock, whether it's interviews, whether it's news from around the world. And that's the station I work on at the moment. It's called News Radio and it's just all domestic international news, current affairs rolling. When I go into a studio, uh, generally I've got to listen to quite a few different things. So there'll be a guest sitting opposite me that I'll be listening to and thinking about where the interview is going, where I want to take it. There'll be a producer speaking in my ear and my headphones telling me other things like, you know, we've only got two minutes on this because we've got to get to the next tape or there's some breaking news, have a look up on the screen, a variety of messages that come from him. Um, And so you're conscious because when I look outside the studio, there's also people who are sitting out there, people putting news bulletins together, people preparing for the next show, a variety of people. So that's almost like a gauge of an audience. So I can tell when something is gripping 
from the person I'm talking to because they'll stop doing their work and they'll be listening. And I think that's really important. So when I go into a studio, I put my headphones on and I have it on my left ear. I keep the headphone on my ear because that's where I'm listening to the program that's coming out. I can hear the levels of my voice, of my guest's voice. That's where my producer's speaking to me. And I take the other pad of the earphone off my ear so that I can also hear the, the ambience of the room because sometimes that gives you a bit of a different feel. And so there's a great Buddhist lesson I learned once, and they said, with all of your senses, you have to do all things. So with your ears, you're not just listening, you're also seeing, you're also feeling, you're also all of those aspects. So the same with your eyes. You need to hear with your eyes sometimes. And I know that sounds really strange, but for example, if I'm talking to you in a studio, in my studio, and there's all the bank of windows and I'm looking out, I need to be able to hear with my eyes because I can't hear what's going on outside the studio. But with my eyes, I can hear what they're hearing. I can hear if they're being impressed or they're bored or whatever, and then it's time to, to move on. How long's a typical shift for you and how do you stay completely focused given the fact that you have someone talking in your ear, you've got visual elements in the room, you have a person you may be interviewing who's face-to-face and in front of you, but equally I assume most of the interviewing you do is actually via the telephone. Yeah, there's a lot of telephone interviewing for yeah. sure. And and as you say, we've also got a bank of television monitors that we're watching all the time. So we have BBC, we have Al Jazeera, we have CNN, we have ABC, we have Sky, we have Fox Sport. So it's it, you're sort of you're bombarded with things constantly. Uh, Our on-air shift is three and a half hours. So at the moment, I do the drive program. So I'm on air at 4pm and I stay on air till 7.30pm. And each half hour is made up of an eight-minute news bulletin, which I read. Uh, I throw to a sports person that does a five-minute update on sport. Then I come back and do weather. Then we get a traffic update. And then I have basically the back half of every half an hour, 15 minutes, to do interviews. And we'll do about three interviews in each of those blocks. Or or interviews that others have done that we'll play that we've got from other parts of the the network um, or that we've taken from BBC or Al Jazeera, depending on where the breaking news is. Um, Yeah, so three and a half hours on air. We get um, three and a half hours to prepare for that. I normally get in earlier than everybody else because I like to be more across things than other people. <laughs> um, and then I've also I've also been across stuff. I wake up early and I'm across all the news from all around the world. I've already sent requests for interviews with people. So, you know, I work about... <laughs> If people actually monitored it and put it down on paper, it'd be between 15 and 18 hours a day. So it's all the time. I work all the time, (laughs) which means I'm listening to a lot of people all the time. But I love it. You know, it's it's certainly not a job you could do if you didn't love it. Because my my job is also split into different um, areas. So that's the show I do four days a week. I also do um, once a week, there's a show that we have on ABC TV called Q&A, which is an audience, you know, room full of people and they speak to a panel of experts, normally a couple of politicians, um, some other, you know, uh, academics or some sort of leaders. And the audience gets to ask questions that are on their mind about whatever the issue is. Uh, That goes to air for an hour on TV and then off the back of that I do another hour which is, it's actually a Facebook program called Q&A Extra where people call into my radio station. So it's the only talkback we do on news radio and people call from all around Australia and a real variety of ages. There's, There's a guy that phones regularly but he's not the only one who is still at school And then there's others right at the end who are in their 80s. We get this real variety of people from every state and territory and they phone in to talk about what they've heard and how they perceive it and what they think the issues are and what they worry about at their stage of life. So it's quite fascinating. And then I also do a one-hour program each week, which is a sports politics program. 
And that actually takes up a lot of time because I'm sort of filtering everything that's going on around the world and I try and get international guests for that. So then it's working out time zones because, as you know, Australia's not really in anybody's convenient time zone. Um, So some days I'll start work at 5.30 in the morning, you know, and I'll finish at 11 o'clock at night when I can get the last interview. So that's just how it goes. Deep listening. Écoute attentive. Penne ascoltare. Ukulalela fieleja. Coming back to the uh, three and a half hour focus work that you do on the national broadcaster, what are the techniques you use to stay in the moment when you're actually interviewing the person in front of you or on the phone with all those distractions going on? Do you know, my hardest thing is actually hopping out of it. I can concentrate for hours. And I think with every guest I talk to, I could get so much more out of them. So the actual deep concentration comes beforehand. So if I know, here are the six people I'm interviewing. One will be talking about the energy crisis. One will be talking about Rohingya Muslims fleeing Burma. One will be talking about whether the Socceroos coach is going to be sacked. I mean, it's such a variety and it's so sort of all-encompassing. And I know that with each of them, I've got between four and seven minutes. So my concentration comes before I go on air and I like to get right across the topic as deeply as I can in, in the short space of time I have to know what what are the sticking points, what are the crucial areas, what where could this go, what are the pros and cons I try and dig as deeply as I can and that comes from listening to other interviews that they've done or looking at other people that are giving a a different perspective, reading as much as possible and then I sort of condense that down into uh, the essence of the story and with my four to seven minutes with them, it's like throwing darts and trying to hit a bullseye each time. You've just got to get straight to the point Uh, and quite often... um, If you're really well researched, you're not going to be surprised by any of the answers and you can continue to to control where the interview goes, knowing what the outcome is that you're after. Sometimes people will say things completely differently or have a revelation midway through the interview, which just changes it, changes all the boundaries. And so you have to be right in that moment with them to be able to hear that, but also to judge from their senses if, if they're nervous if they're angry, if they're sad, and, and try and try and work with that, try to make them feel as comfortable as they can so that they can express it as openly and honestly as they can. Talk us through a revelation. I'll tell you a story about Greg Norman. So Greg Norman, who was a number one golfer for, for a decade, you know, Australia's greatest ever golfer, but depressingly fell so short of winning the majors that he should have won. So he won two British Opens, I think, by memory. I haven't looked. But but the the US um, Masters is the golf tournament to win. And he fell short. And there was one time, 1996, he was so far ahead going into the final round. It was his. And the whole world, not just Australia, but everybody from any country that knew anything about golf really wanted Greg to win (laughs) because he'd struggled so often before and been beaten in a playoff and, you know, it was just so crucial. So there was a lot riding on it and he just disintegrated on that final round and and everybody was watching and it was tragic. Anyway, it was some years later, I was doing an interview with him and it was a half-hour sort of tell-all interview and... uh, I said to him at one point, you know, where do you go when, when you're on your own, when, when you're by yourself, when you've got nothing to do? And he said, no, my day starts at 5 a.m. I'm very organised, I'm very committed, I'm right into my business as well as my fitness and my golf and I go to bed about 11.30 p.m. and my diary is worked out in five-minute blocks, so I'm very intense. I said, yes, but there are times when, when all of that stops and it all falls away and there's just you. And again, he tried to say, well, no, there's never just me. I'm surrounded by people. I've got managers. I've got family. I've got sponsors. I've got teammates. I've got, you know. No, Greg, listen to me. When it's you, in your head, what happens in your head? And he stopped and he didn't say anything. 
and then he started crying. And I thought, oh, my gosh, you know, this is, this is when you've turned on a tap that hasn't been turned on for a very long time. And then his whole demeanour in the interview changed because it wasn't about Greg Norman, the professional, anymore. And he is so professional. It was about, you know, how difficult it can be and, and it doesn't always go the way you want or you don't always get the reward for the effort that you've put in. But how do you keep going? How do you refine that? How do you pick yourself up and try again and again and again? And so it was quite interesting. And he'd done a lot of reading and a lot of study, a lot of thought he'd given to Zen Buddhism, uh, which was quite intriguing. And that obviously gave him his uh, strength and his moments when there might have been a whole lot of action happening around him, but he could retreat inside to that deep moment where you just want to connect with yourself. Was that an example of where you'd planned and you were deliberate, that's where you were going to throw the dart? Not really. There was so much to talk about. But but in listening to him, you just got this sense that it was all this external stuff. And yet I know, you know, what, what appeals to most people, especially when you work with a medium like, and that was for TV actually, but when you work in radio especially, you know that people do actually listen quite deeply and and they want to be able to relate. So you need to find those little windows that, that open up so that the listener can hop inside the guest and, and vice versa. You know, the, the guest opens themselves mm. and says, yes, you know, this is, this is where I go when nobody knows. Deep listening. Akshava amuka. Deep listening. L'écoute profonde. For those of you who aren't able to watch Tracy in action, the intensity she talked about in her preparation was extraordinary. Her body tensed up in a way that gave me a sense of a great deal of focus. It also brought a great deal of energy and a great deal of determination. A question I'd love to explore with you, though, is the opposite. If you gave that all up, if you didn't prepare for an interview, what do you think you'd discover that's on the other side of intensity, determination and research? What do you think you're missing out on by preparing to this extent? (laughs) I don't think I'm missing out on anything. (laughs) Um, You know, because I like to to bury into things. I I want to explore. Um, My childhood was spent... We left Australia when I was three and we're on a boat. It was a great big ship called the Galileo and it took 17 days to get to South Africa. My mum and dad, my mum was at that time, let me figure out the ages here, 21. My dad was 24 and they were surfers and this was in the era when surfing was, was exploding as, as, a, as a lifestyle, I suppose. But they'd kind of grown up in it and it was nothing new for them, but they heard there were good waves in South Africa. So we hopped on the Galileo and I remember, this is my first memory, I remember being on the boat and there are a whole lot of people down on the shore and we were looking over the edge and waving goodbye. Obviously, the family was all gathered there, you know, my mum's brothers and sisters and kids and extended family and my dad's friends. And and I had these streamers that I was throwing over the boat. And, you know, you're meant to hold on to the end of the streamer. Anyway, I let the streamer go completely. <laughs> and I think it was my dad that went, no, you're not meant to do that. You're meant to hold on to it, you know. And I turned and looked at my mum and she was crying. And I said, don't worry, Mum, there's other streamers. And obviously she wasn't crying about the streamers. You know, she was crying because she was waving goodbye and didn't know when she was going to see her family and friends next Mm. as we headed off on this big adventure. And I remember so clearly thinking that even at three, (laughs) Mum's crying about something else. So I need to watch and listen and just be quiet and try and work out what's happening here. Mm. And so that's what I've always done. And so when people say, you know, how did you end up doing this job? It's like, well, I don't think I actually ended up 
doing a job. I think I just kept doing what I've always done. And when I'm not thinking about digging into something or trying to explore somebody or, or trying to find elements of them that they've never discussed before, mm. uh, I actually, I go into a meditation and I go to the back of my head and it's like I close my eyes and retreat as far back and as deeply as I can go and it's like there's a little seat and I just sit there and it's dark and the world still exists but I'm just very quiet, in a very quiet place. That's where I go when I'm not thinking about exploring. You've had the opportunity to work across many cultures in different parts of the world, in the most vibrant parts of the world, in fact. How did you listen differently when you were doing work in Asia? <laughs> I remember when we moved to Beijing. So we'd lived in Hong Kong for four years. And when we moved to Hong Kong, our youngest kid was six weeks old. Uh, the next one was four. The next one was seven. Okay, so they were quite young. And, and we lived in a little fishing village and not many of the locals spoke English. So you had to listen and, and I remember trying to teach the kids, you, the words are not making sense yet, but they will, you know, they're just different sounds. But watch everything else, you know, watch how people move, watch their hand gestures, watch where they look because that might be telling you to look somewhere. So you've got to listen in different ways. And, and after four years there, we had the best experiences. Then we moved to Beijing and it was a different version of Chinese. You know, it was Mandarin as opposed to Cantonese, which sounds completely different again. So we we're going through this whole process. And we always chose to live not with other expats. We chose to live really sort of immersed in, in, in a locality that, that would give us the experience of something that was very uh, intense and real for that particular place. So that was hard for the kids, but they embraced it as, as an adventure, as we were doing. And uh, I, remember, I remember when people would come to visit, I, I actually went off to university in Beijing, the Bang, uh, Beijing Language and Culture University, and did an intense Mandarin course. So at least I got a bit of a head start. But our youngest son, three years old, so he was just learning. He was still picking up his English vocabulary. We sent him to the local school. They start school at three. And he was learning to write characters. No one at his school spoke English. None of the teachers spoke English. So he was immersed in Chinese from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. It was a long day. They used to have three meals there. They used to have their little afternoon nap there. Like It was like living in a boarding school, but that was just school for three-year-olds in mainland China. And so he'd come home and, and he'd be mixing up all these words, half of them be in English, then he'd have half in Mandarin. And, and what was interesting was watching how somebody would pick the best word and, and when you learn other languages, and I don't speak other languages, so don't get me wrong, but I know bits and pieces of some, and some words in some languages just sound so much better. They, they fit the object it describes so much better than the word we have. And so it was interesting watching a little kid's mind juggle the words to fit it the best way he thought. Um, so that was quite fascinating. But then in speaking with locals, I, I, I don't mind being sort of parachuted into a place where I don't know anything, I don't know anyone, I don't know what they're saying. I'm really happy with that. In fact, I love it <laughs> because it's a challenge to try and understand and, and to hear in different ways. And I know when people are with me, and they can't understand what somebody's saying. I can't either, but I sort of somehow I, I know what they're trying to say. And people are always saying to me, what do they mean? What are they saying? And, and I can tell them it's really weird. It's a really strange thing. But I think it's just that through my work and through, you know, the intense focus you have to have over a sustained period of years and all of the experiences I've had, you learn to read people's faces and you read their body language and you read things that you can almost see what's going through their mind. And so 
generally speaking, not to any great depth, but generally speaking, I know what they're saying without even understanding the language they're speaking. Sounds a bit weird, sounds a bit conceited, but it's not. It's just, that's just what's happened because my whole life I've been in those situations. It's a really common thread with all the listeners we've interviewed. They all talk about their ability to listen with their eyes and that's a really well-developed skill. They also talk about their ability to listen to the energy coming from the other person's body and they talk about the congruency between what's coming out of their mouth and what their body and eyes are showing. Equally, variation in language tone, so you talked about the nerves or the the voice might, might quaver a bit. So I was curious while you were talking about the fact that you can listen to people just by watching them, what what are you hearing from me during this interview? <laughs> I'm hearing that you're listening and uh, when somebody speaks, you you not just watch them but you imagine what they're saying, don't you? And so I can see you putting those pictures in your mind and, and I think that's that's a really good skill of a listener, that you're not just hearing words coming out of a mouth, but you're hopping into their shoes. And as they describe something, you're imagining being in that place. And the way you come up with good questions, like you're doing, is that by imagining you're in that place, it's foreign to you. It's not what you've experienced. So questions jump into your mind. Oh, well, how would you deal with this? Or how, how did you cope with that? Because you need to walk in that those other the other person's shoes to be able to to know what it must have been that they were feeling or or trying to explore those moments. And I get that sense from you that you're not just hearing what I'm saying, you're seeing it and you're feeling it. And that's how that's how you question people. Deep listening. Deep listening. Tiefes Zuhören. Deep listening. Coming up, what can the Chinese teach us about listening differently? We explore with Tracy how to read people's faces, how to watch what they do with their body, even when you don't speak their language. We explore the role of art and how it helps us to understand cultures differently and inform the way we can listen across a culture. Listen through the lens of the Sydney 2000 Olympics and how the world was listening to the event and yet Australia had created a totally different story, one that they were listening to in a completely different way. You've worked in other parts of Asia as well. How how has that experience transformed you professionally? I think for other people I've worked with who've worked in international markets. They bring an extraordinary perspective of empathy. They bring an extraordinary perspective of history. They bring an extraordinary perspective of understanding it on a slightly different level. When you come to your work now, what do you think Asia's brought into the way you think about your questions when you're working? You really need to open open your eyes and open your heart and open everything. Just be open to be able to to know what's going on in other places. And oh, I get so frustrated sometimes. Australia is such an island, you know. We are so far removed from the rest of the world without even realising it. And that's that's of great benefit too, that's why we've been a relatively safe place. We're too far away for anyone to come and invade, you know? And what does it matter in 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 reality when you look at the the big economies, you know, or you look at the big humanity, you look at India, you look at China with a billion people each. We're 24 million. We're we're a small city in those places. That's all we are. But, of course, we're Australia and we're a big country and we're proud. That's, that's all fine. But you have to put it into perspective with these other places and, and what's going on in other places. Back in 2000, I was working for the Sydney Olympic Committee. I was the spokesperson for the organisation. So I had to deal with um, both local media and the international media. And it was so interesting hearing the questions that the local media would ask 
and hearing the questions that the international media would ask was two completely different planets and what they were seeing through the prism of the Olympics, you know? How, how different were those oh, questions? Oh, we were seeing, oh, how much money we're spending and how are we going to win enough seats in the ballot? You know, I want to get my six tickets and it's a fraud, it's not going to work and, you know, and we've got more roads and power poles are coming down and it's like, And yes, the international yes. journalists? And the international journalists were, you know, more about humanity, you know, and talking about the fact that... For, for the 200 countries that came here to compete, every single one of those nations had a community here in Australia. They could go somewhere on their day off from competing and sit and talk in their language and eat their food and compare their notes about the world here in Australia. Pausing and taking you back to that space at the back of your head where you're sitting down and you're just coming back to yourself. Can you picture an interview where you're preparing and you realise that the questions you're asking are broader, are more inclusive because you've had this global perspective? Does one or two of those interviews come to mind where you may have asked or taken a different perspective in your preparation? Look, I think it plays out in different ways in different interviews and in every interview because you can't unlearn something. And once you've been open to that, then it's always there. And it always forms the basis of where you come from next. So, you know, I know when when I'm talking to people, I I pull in different things that I've learnt in different places. And also it's given me some understanding in when I'm talking to somebody from a different place who might not be feeling so comfortable, a way of making them relax a little more and and feel at ease because I know where they come from. I remember when I first started learning uh, Cantonese and my teacher said to me, you know, imagine a Chinese painting and Chinese paintings, quite famous, they're, they're quite large. You might have a great big cliff and you've got a waterfall and there's a little fishing boat down the bottom. There's all these little tiny intricacies. And you've got some Chinese characters down the side, which is generally, you know, a famous saying or a poem or something describing. But there's also a lot of space. And she said, this is how Chinese think. And this is how the Chinese language developed. There's a big space... There's lots of little elements and the artist paints what he paints and those are the words that describe it, but there's all this space in the middle for you to imagine what you would bring to that space. And I thought that is really different, isn't it, you know, compared to our artwork where we fill up the entire page with everything. And the other aspect to that is that when they speak... The biggest thing comes at the start and it filters down to the smallest thing. So when we speak, it's almost the opposite. How often we start a sentence with, I went, (laughs) I am, I was, I this, I that, I, 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 I'm the most important thing in my world and this is how I colour it. And our artwork looks a bit like that. We fill it up. But theirs is completely different. And so, you know, a normal sentence for them might be, Russia, next week, I am going. And the I ends up falling off the sentence. So in some sentences, you don't even need to put the I, you know. You're just saying, Russia, next week. (laughs) That's where we're off to. Uh, Because that's the big thing. And then you imagine yourself in it. So it's really important to understand how language is used because... We think in words. We think in a language. And that's what draws our pictures for us. That's what exposes our imagination to things. And so if people are coming from a different language group, they think differently about the same things. We, we, we might look at this table. There's a fantastic book called The Geography of Thought. And it talks about the difference between East and West. And they did this experiment where they had a big fish tank and they brought in Asians to look at the fish tank and they brought in Europeans to look at the fish tank and go away and then write down what they saw. So the Europeans predominantly, and, you know, we can't stereotype, there were, there were some exceptions, of course, but predominantly 
the Europeans said, oh, it was about four feet long and two feet wide and there were two big orange fish and some big green seaweed. And the Asians would say, oh, there was in the left back corner, there was a little tiny chest, like a treasure chest. And there were little bubbles that were coming up in the front right hand corner. And they could, they, they remembered all the little intricacies because they were drawing the complete picture where we were just looking for what stands out most, what can I take away from this? There's, there's, there's my artwork. So, yeah, it, we're different. The world is different. When you speak a different language, you're thinking about the same thing differently and it's really lovely to be able to try and understand where everybody's coming from because in, in the end it's, it's one world, isn't it? It's one world, it's one place, but we all interpret it completely differently. And that's a good thing. Yeah, there's a beautiful African word, Mbutu, which means we're all connected. And uh, it's a common phrase we use uh, in the podcast. Have you ever wondered what ancient cultures can teach us about listening? Coming up, Clinton Pryor listens to remote and regional communities. He explores the power of silence in listening. As he steps across a continent, he walks himself 6,000 kilometres from one side of the continent to the other, more importantly spending that time listening to others. You've been informed by Asia, but you've also had the opportunity to be heavily influenced by our First Nations people in Australia. What do you think they bring to you as a gift in your role as an interviewer? Oh, they gave me my husband <laughs> and my children. <laughs> They've given me a lot. <laughs> um, so I'm eternally grateful for that. And every single day I'm learning. So it's, uh, it's quite fascinating. And, you know, we're talking about language. There, there are so many different Indigenous language um, languages spoken around Australia, the ones that haven't been lost, the ones that weren't killed off um, by white settlement when they were told that they weren't allowed to use their language anymore. My husband's grandfather was chained to a tree for three days because the police heard him speaking his own language to his children. They were in the park and he called them and said, it's time to go home. But because he used his language and it had been outlawed in New South Wales, they chained him to a tree and left him there for three days. And, and that, that kills a person. You imagine being told now you can't speak your language anymore. You have to speak this foreign language, which doesn't think the same way that we think. It doesn't give you the same descriptions that you're familiar with. Anyway, that's a separate story. So what else they've given me is... Um, you know, you talk about listening. They are really good listeners and they use space between words really well. We kind of feel intimidated by space. I even know, this is interesting too, when we're editing interviews and I tell young ones that are coming through, young producers, they have this temptation where they listen back to an interview and they edit out all the spaces between the question and the answer. And I, I remember just recently I called one of them aside and I said, listen, when you listen back to this interview and you ask a question and there's a big pause, why do you think there's a pause before that person answers? Oh, well, they were nervous or, or they didn't know how or they were confused or they felt confronted. I said, exactly. So if you edit that space out, you're taking all of that away. But the listener has to be able to know that because the answer that comes is on the back of that confusion or dilemma or, you know, period of stark silence, which means clearly they're thinking about something very deeply. Oh, you know, they, they got that. And Indigenous people use that brilliantly. Even this week, we've seen news with Clinton Pryor, who's an Indigenous, young Indigenous man who has walked from Perth to Canberra to meet with Malcolm Turnbull, the Prime Minister and the Governor-General. 
And he decided he'd do that because the previous Prime Minister, Tony Abbott, said that we need to close down remote communities. So he decided he would walk from one side of the country to the other and stop at a variety of communities and ask them what message they'd like to give the Prime Minister, why it was important to keep remote communities or was it not? Whatever their perspectives were, he gathered these stories. He's, he's just this young guy with such a great vision. So he walked 6,000 kilometres. He got to Canberra on the weekend. On Monday or, or Tuesday, um, Bill Shorten went to meet him. The Governor-General went to meet him. And on Wednesday, the Prime Minister said, well, he can come and meet me, but he can walk with his elders around the back of Parliament House, come through security and meet me in my private courtyard. And he just said, hang on a second, I've walked 6,000 miles to see you and you can't walk out the front door of Parliament House to see me. OK, as you wish, he walked around the back through security met Malcolm Turnbull and he had this collection of stories. So he was reading out what Indigenous people would like. And while he was doing that, Malcolm Turnbull kept talking over the top of him, not really wanting to hear what he had to say and wanting to control the story and not let this man deliver his story from his people that he collected right across the continent. So Clinton Pryor turned, stopped talking, turned and walked away. And I think in his silence, he said everything that needed to be said. Great story about the power of silence and uh, just be comfortable with it. What advice would you give politicians to listen better? That's it. You've just given it to them. Just listen. You don't always have to have an answer. You know, when, and I know you've spoken with people who have to deal with, uh, you know, palliative care, people who are dying. The important thing is not to give them an answer or tell them what's going to happen next or, or try and make them feel better or say it'll be all right because it's not going to be all right. People are dying. They just want you to listen and, and have a sense that somebody is next to me that is trying to understand. Somebody is with me because they're just with me not because they're going to lecture me. If the politicians listened, gee, I think they'd their jobs would be a whole lot easier. But I also understand that they too get caught up in this 24-7 relentless, you know, Twitter, Facebook. <laughs> and, and I'm obsessed too. I love Twitter, absolutely love Twitter. So um, are, you, are you admitting to maybe being a contributing factor to all of this? Oh, well, no, I hope I'm not contributing in in that sense. You know, I certainly don't react to every negative response that comes through because, you know, 24-7 I'd be busy doing that. Mm. But, but, you know, sometimes, like we were saying, the pauses say so much more. And I think Australian politicians actually need to stop responding to the media which is me, and actually deal with the country again. And even the media, like the media has got a lot to answer for because the reporting, there are some some really great work, but predominantly it's trash. You know, it doesn't deal with the big issues. If I have to listen to another interview where... All they're trying to get is a 30-second promo grab or a headline. I'm not interested in headlines. Headlines are here today, gone tomorrow. And politicians shouldn't care about the headlines here today, gone tomorrow. Let's talk about the substance. And and I think that's the issue. People want the country to to grow and get better and and complicated issues. You know, the the whole... um, refugee situation is a complicated issue. It's not black and white. But be prepared to try and take the country on a journey with you. Explain it in its fullness. And and let's relate it to everything else that it relates to. We, we can't go and have dinner at the corner Chinese restaurant if we never let Chinese people in. 
that doesn't happen, you know? Do we want to go back to that? Instead of having this discussion at the extremes, there's a whole lot of discussion in the middle, which I think people are more than willing to listen to. And of course, you're always going to have people that refuse to see the other side. And that's fine. That's a democracy and that's freedom of speech. But when all we do is react to the extremes and when most of what we do in the media is report the extremes, then we're not actually getting a true picture of what is going on and we're not actually helping get anywhere or improve anything for anybody. To be brutally honest, I'm not a fan of any politician. I'm not a fan of anyone or anything, to be honest, because I just think we're all the same and we can all contribute to making the place better. Um, And so I'm always very conscious also of describing people as role models because I think you put too much on them. You know, I think you can actually look at everybody and learn something from them. Uh, Everybody can teach us something. I know I walk around with a little tiny microphone that I carry in my bag. It's always there. And so if I see somebody who looks pretty interesting or looks like they've got a bit of a different story to tell, I'll ask them if I can record an interview with them on my phone and I put them up on Facebook. Just It's just my thing. It's not for radio or whatever. And I remember sitting down with a guy I used to talk to often, walking through the streets of Glebe, and he was often there begging. And so one day I said to him, can I sit down and do an interview with you? And he said, what for? I said, because you're really interesting. I I stop and talk to you, you know, every second day when I see you. So he said, yeah, okay. I said, I'll put it on Facebook if you don't mind. He goes, I don't know anything about Facebook. I said, no, that's fine. So, So we sat down and had a chat. And people loved that interview because this guy was he's not just a homeless person sitting on the street with nothing, asking for money. He had a story, how he ended up there, why he chose to stay there, what he saw were the big problems in Australia, problems he'd encountered, what he worried about. And he worried about the same things that we worry about. You worry about whether your kids are going to be okay. You want them to have jobs and shelter and safety. All the same things. And so suddenly people could see that this was not just a guy that you walk past and try and ignore. This was you and me in different circumstances, you know. And and I think um, in that respect, you can look at everybody and you can you can learn something from them. You can take something away that helps to make you better and helps to make you want to contribute to make the overall picture better. But as far as things that I go back to again and again, I do go back to Buddhist teachings a lot because I just find them... I find them very... uh, inclusive, but not in any kind of condescending way. They don't lecture. They do a lot of listening. They do a lot of watching and a lot of meditating. So just thinking about anything, pick a word. They do a lot of meditating about death because how can you work with somebody that is dying or look after somebody the best way without truly understanding what it is they're going through? I mean, I know if if I'm going to do a half-hour interview with somebody because it's a half-hour interview, mm. just let it go. And and I, you know, so I, I really prepare. I know where I'm going to go. I, I, I want to go on a journey, but I want to take them places where they haven't been and where the audience hasn't been before. So I think about all these sort of deviations, but I also think about how to bring it back because you've got to get to a logical kind of finish. Um so I, I work through conversations in my head with these people before I sit with them, which is why it's important to look back at interviews they've done before or read books. And, and the stuff I do a lot is actually try and gather perspectives from other people that they've given about this person. Yeah. 
um, because that really helps too because, you know, not everyone sees them this way. You know, these people see them a different way, so let's explore that a bit. And then I, I know where I'm going and then I'll reduce that to like maybe four key questions I really want to ask and then I've got room to ask questions that, yeah, that, that go in different directions depending where the conversation goes. Perfect place to finish. Thank you, Tracy. Been a pleasure. Thank you. Deep listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. There are many lessons I take away from Tracy's interview. The role of preparation is right at the centre. The image of Tracy sitting back at the back of her mind in a quiet place, in a dark place, where she can remove all the emotion from herself as the person conducting the interview so she can access the emotion in others. Interviewing Tracy face to face, it was clear that she's intensely passionate about the connection across all of humanity. She reminded me that when she was teaching young reporters across Asia, you can ask any question, yet it's how you ask it that's the most powerful. How are you asking questions? Do people notice what you're saying? Or do they notice how you're saying it? Thanks for listening. Deep listening. Deep listening. Lourdes LaSalle. Hukai Kikitori. Deep listening. Deep listening. Whakarongo Pohonu. Deep listening. Impact beyond words.